Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Centre for Legal Innovations Legal Gen AI Around the World series. Today, we have the great pleasure of spending time with these amazing folks that I'll introduce you to in just a second, focusing on Europe and the UK. Just uh, if I may introduce myself, I'm Terry Modisette. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law. So firstly, thank you very much to all of our amazing panellists today, if I may introduce you to them. Uh, Giulio Coraggio, who is a partner and the location head of Italian Intellectual Property and Technology Department at DLA Piper. Welcome, Giulio. Great to have you here. Um, Uace Iqbal, who is the founder of Simplexico. Hi, Uace. Um, Tanya Podnik who is the Global Legal Gen AI Lead at PwC. Welcome, Tanya. And last but certainly not least, Tara Waters, who's a partner and the Chief Digital Officer at Ashurst. An amazing panel. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be an amazing discussion and I want to jump straight into it. I, I wanted to kick off firstly by asking each of you a little bit about yourselves. For those of um, us that don't know you, either live or we'll pick this session up, uh, later on demand. Um, you know, I guess what you're what you're doing in this area of generative AI, what you do generally, and where you feel your firms or organizations are on the Gen AI journey. And Tara, because you were the last to be introduced, I'm going to kick off with you first in relation to this question. Great, thanks. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Tara. Um, I've been working in the legal industry for the past 15 years. Before that, I spent seven years in the technology industry as a developer, and I'm a corporate and capital markets lawyer by background um, with a focus on the technology sector. Um, and that kind of mix of co and combination of experience and expertise led me into my current role as chief digital officer. So we're looking at, um, in particular, in relation to AI and Gen AI, but more broadly, how we're using these technologies and new technologies both within the firm to help empower our people in the delivery of their services and their day-to-day -day work, as well as how we might be able to leverage that from a client-facing perspective. I think starting, of course, with um, just internally getting that capability. So for the past 18 months, we've been scanning the market, looking at different tools. And, and, and in fact, um, there'll be some news from us in the next week. Um, we are about to roll out our first um, global enterprise-wide Gen AI platform. So that um, as that first step, we've got Gen AI in the hands of each of our people. Uh, and then we can move to whatever next, um, whatever the next step is, step two and step three. So the other bit to that, Tara, is you're exhausted and need a holiday very quickly as well, I think, right? That quickly kind of slides in there. Thank you very much. Um, Tanya, how about you? Thanks, Terry, and it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. So, um, hi, guys. I'm Tanya Podnich. I am a lawyer. I've spent most of my time working in large global law firms in the general counsel departments, advising on regulatory and compliance issues associated with the firm, but also associated with tech adoption um, and tech transformation within kind of the legal space. Um, I now work at PwC as their global legal Gen AI lead. And there my role is essentially, I, I wear two hats. Uh, first hat is to advise our legal arm internally on how we can leverage generative AI in order to really transform the way that we deliver services to our clients. And then the second arm, which is probably slightly more exciting, dare I say, is working with clients and in-house departments, looking at how they can use generative AI in kind of their day-to-day -day as well, and whether or not it is suitable for, for the complex problems that they have. In terms of PwC and where we're at, um, very fortunate to work for such like for such a large organization with a lot of scale, which basically means that they have the ability to invest heavily in um, areas which they believe are going to really transform their business as well as their clients' business. So I've been really lucky enough to be using a lot of um, generative AI tools over the last 18 months. I think if there was a way to explain the PwC kind of dynamic, it's literally, you know, building the plane as we are flying it because it's very much try this, doesn't work, move on, um, try and explore the technology that's going on to its maximum capability. So, yeah. That... I think that plane is very full, Tanya, I think because <laughs> everyone's on it. So, um, 
it's it's going to be interesting to see how we're flying it as well, which we'll get into in this session. Uwes, how about you? Tell us a little about yourself and where you're at. Hi, everyone. My name is Uwes Iqbal. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Terry. Um, I, I don't have a legal background. I've never actually worked as or practiced as a lawyer. I've never worked in a law firm. Um, I, I have a background as an AI practitioner. So I, um, I studied theoretical physics at, at university, and then I moved into the technology world. I worked at a host of startups, legal tech startups. Um, so you might be familiar with some of them, Iga Technologies in the Thought River. And then I also worked at the, the Innovation Lab in Thomson Reuters, and I held roles as a machine learning engineer, data scientist, um, AI practitioner. So I come from a world of um, building um, AI in the legal sector for close to a decade now. And um, at some point, I was quite frustrated with the the status quo of how technology was being delivered in, into law firms, particularly with AI, particularly with AI. So I thought it might be worth a go trying to do something different. So I set up some Plexico in uh, August of 22. And, and lo and behold, an AI kicked off in November, December of 22. And then since then, it's been a bit of a crazy roller coaster journey. <laughs> so at Simplexico, we've, um, we've ended up positioning ourselves as an AI services company targeting the legal sector. So we offer AI um, services around AI education, um, helping law firms and legal teams get educated and pro uh, proficient with the technology. We do a lot of work around um, use case design and development, going into law firms and legal teams, helping them really identify in a very structured way how to think about use cases for AI. And then the more interesting part is we've, uh, we partner with, with law firms and legal teams to actually collaborate and build out um, specialist bespoke AI um, solutions or applications for, for legal practice workflows. Um, so I come from a perspective of building these, um, uh, building with this technology and from a perspective of in, in the front lines or in the trenches of trying to understand how to make this technology relevant and, and useful for, for, for folks in the legal sector. I think we first connected in the relatively early days of Simplexico and it's just been an absolute delight to see how your business has grown. So congratulations to you. It's, Thank you. Uh, it's been amazing, really been amazing. Um, Julio, last but certainly not least, how about you? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, as you said, I'm uh, the head of uh, intellectual property and technology here at DLA Piper in Italy. I'm part of our global um, uh, AI and uh, data uh, practices. By background, I'm a technology and data lawyer. And I, I think my role is twofold. On the one end, uh, we assist clients in the implementation of uh, their AI solutions in the sense that we need to make sure that the AI solutions are uh, implemented in a compliant manner. We uh, developed even legal tech tools to support clients in this hard task. And uh, this comes to my second, uh, the second stream of my practice because um, I try to assist clients in uh, an innovative manner uh, as the other participants to this webinar emphasized uh, the law practice is changing. Uh, clients expect us to complement our legal offering through legal tech tools and um, lawyers need to change their background. Uh, sometimes clients tell me, uh, are you a lawyer or an engineer? Uh, and uh, honestly, I think that lawyers during this specific time they need to be in between. Uh, I haven't studied engineering at all, uh, but we need to know the technology. We need to have um, uh, relationships with um, uh, suppliers. We need to develop um, technology uh, internally uh, because clients expect us to do so, especially from uh, a, such an innovative law firm like DLA Piper. Mm. Absolutely. The world is definitely changing. We, we, we touched on the use cases, and I guess um, that's where we often land. Uh, I don't know if it's the right place to where we land, but it is where we often land. So I thought we'd chat about that and almost get it out of the way um, early on in this session. But, I, I mean, I think it's difficult to argue that there are no use cases. They're certainly emerged and emerging, I guess, is probably the way to describe them. But I was wondering, and I'm going to start with you on this one, Tanya, I was, I was wondering where you're seeing those use cases emerge and maybe give us a little bit of a descriptor about what they are. And, 
you know, what's pushing some forward, maybe limiting some or holding them back as the case may be. Thanks, Terry. So I think it's important to pick up on what Julia was saying about knowing the technology. And I think I completely agree with you whether or not we should start with use cases is kind of a debate for another time. The reality is, is that we need to understand the technology itself, the limitations and capability of the technologies before we even get into the use cases. And I think the reason why we need to do that is because the technology is not perfect. So we shouldn't be going to large language models at this present moment in time and expecting a hallucination-free, 100% accurate answer every time. Um, in some instances, that may be possible using techniques such as retrieval augmented generation, but even that kind of has its limitations. So number one, the use case piece, you need to understand how the technology works. When you understand how the technology works, then only can you apply it to kind of the use cases or where it is best suited. I want to emphasize that point because I think that that, I mean, I'll start off with the limiting piece. What is limiting in my view and what I have seen is that people expect the technology to perform and behave in a certain way when that is not what it is built for. So for instance, we have a contract redlining module. Um, that's one of the key use cases that's kind of going around with our clients. And they look at some of the tools and they say, well, I, I wouldn't have phrased it in that way. Or actually it's missed one bit. Or um, if there's like a hairline addendum in some appendix, would that pick it up? The reality is, is that this is why we are lawyers and this is why we exist. So we can pick up those, you know, um, hairline addendums so we can read through it and say, well, actually, that's not phrased accurately in order to have the reasoning and the response that I need it to. So I'm going to rephrase it. I think there's also this expectation that generative AI and certain tools will take over lawyers. In my view, that is not the case. The lawyers still play a very, very heavy role in what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. So limiting is certainly lack of understanding, lack um, and over expectation of the technology. So and that kind of doesn't enable people to move forward because they expect perfection in terms of what's driving adoption. The really obvious ones are, you know, efficiency and cost reduction, uh, the economy in certain um, countries is not performing as well as it you know, could be, which means that budgets are shrinking. As budgets are shrinking, it obviously means that costs are decreasing um, and therefore the money spent on, um, on resources is reducing. So we've had clients come to us and say, I have a, uh, I've just been um, allocated 20% cut on my annual budget and I need to get to a stage where I perform exactly the same amount of tasks with 20% less resources. How do I do that? So trying to work that out um, is really challenging, but it also starts with kind of the tasks piece. The What tasks do lawyers perform? And then which tasks are best suited to the technology that's currently out there? So like I mentioned, redlining is a key one that's coming up. Really easy ones like having a help desk or ingesting your policies and procedures, especially for general counsel departments. You ingest policies, procedures, you can easily extract the information. Um, other use cases, extracting pieces of information from large corpus of um, data, that's been really successful. And then I guess, so that's kind of like on the smaller scale we're seeing organizations say, well, how can I play with this? It's very modular, it's very built on, and that's one thing that I'll say is, I feel as though there's this misconception that generative AI is so expensive and unaffordable and you need to rip up your entire department to actually see benefit from that. From our experience, that's not the case. You can start really small and kind of build on it. There is, of course, the other side, which is enterprise. And I think that is where people are seeing the greatest effects and benefits of generative AI because they are moving to a stage where it's not just about efficiency and cost cutting, it's about data analytics, it's about the information and the data they can derive from all of the um, information that they're processing and then make strategic decisions based on that data. And it's exciting to work on, work on both sides of things because you kind of see the small players really improve and benefit from, um, from what they're doing. And then you see the bigger players making extraordinarily leaps forward. But what you're describing there, Tanya, is also, it seems to be almost like 
creating a process. So don't jump on the next shiny tool that comes along. And I know we'll talk about those in a little bit more. Um, but develop a process and there's value in that process as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's the, you need to start with the problem itself. So we do have cases where um, people say, I just want to use Gen AI because I have a tick box exercise and I need to say that, you know, I'm on top of the, the technology. The reality mm. is, is if you implement the incorrect technology or if you implement it in a way that you're not considering change management, the way that it affects your, um, your people internally and your employees, it is likely to have a negative effect on your business and therefore make it much more difficult in the future to actually go and adopt anything further. Mm. I know that, Tara, you folks have recently, um, obviously recently released a report having looked at a number of tools and obviously that uh, very much wrapped around the use cases as well. Tell us a little bit about what you found or indeed anything else here around the use cases because um, I found that report actually really helpful and enlightening. So um, so please share whatever you would like from that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the key for us was, um, first of all, you know, of course, wanting to look at multiple types of tools. We, were, we looked at some really broad general, you know, general productivity tools that weren't legal focused, as well as ones that were more niche specific to legal and specific legal workflows. But ultimately, you know, to uncover all those use cases, we have hypotheses around where we thought, you know, LLMs work well or might not work well. But the reality was we needed to get that technology in people's hands and let them stress test that as, as much as possible. And so um, over the course of probably about three months, roughly three months, you know, we had our people um, using different different tools and ultimately it was go have a play and we had some structured ways of getting feedback from them so that we understood what they were liking, what they weren't liking, what specifically they were trying to do. And then we, um, based on all of that feedback, we actually structured experiments around the use cases that we thought we wanted to really try to measure and get some quantitative feedback as well as the qualitative feedback. So we had structured experiments. We also did a blind study. So in relation to case summaries, which is probably like the first and classic use case example that a lot of people have explored. You know, we we had um, some of our junior lawyers actually prepare case summaries based on cases that our expertise team put forward um, and nominated. And then we had them blind graded against summaries that we produced ourselves using those tools and were able to see, um, you know, how they stacked up against each other. And that was that was really interesting for a couple of reasons. One, one of the questions we asked our graders who, who were our expertise lawyers um, was what where did you think the source of this case summary came from and actually um, they got it wrong when it came to the AI generated sources they identified it every single lawyer created um, summary but not their 50% wrong on the AI so and the key thing there that we saw was it was when it got it right when it was accurate the AI was accurate it was much more difficult to discern where the source was now of course as Tanya has mentioned and as everyone knows Unfortunately, the AI doesn't get things right every single time. So when it gets it wrong, it's, it's relatively simple to identify when it's getting it wrong or it's perhaps a bit easier. Um, but that was really interesting to see that differentiation. But at the end of the day, in fact, um, the humans outperformed the AI in all but one instance. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we looked really closely at that to try to understand what it, what is it that, you know, makes, um, makes us discern the human <laughs> produced output as different and or better than the AI output. And ultimately our conclusion was we don't quite know yet. There, there are just simply subjective elements of how lawyers work. And I have my personal preferences on the basis of how I was trained and the type of work I do. And I will mark up a document very differently than the next person. And that's just simply the way lawyers operate. So it's not also, it's not about churning out the same exact product each time. And I think that's where the real challenge on the use cases comes from, because we as, as lawyers and experienced lawyers, you have expectations of what your output should look like. The human or the, the machine is not always going to produce it to your specifications. Um, and that's, I think, one of the real kind of psychological hurdles that the lawyers do need to get over and recognize that ultimately it's about getting to that first version 
not the final version and, and the human can then layer on their own nuances and preferences once you get to that first version, but actually that, that efficiency gain and getting to that first version, um, not simply just, hey, draft this, but actually let's mine all of this information that I need to get to the first version. You can do that so much faster with the assistance of an LLM. That's ultimately for us that we saw that was the real value that people were deriving. Um, and But then ultimately what we need is for our people to continue to keep playing and testing and testing the limits of the LLMs because we haven't discovered them yet. We haven't discovered all of the edges of what they can and can't do within legal, especially when you layer on the human nuance of what we perceive as good and not good. So in, in our view, very much, we were looking at how we can qualitatively and quantitatively measure what our people were perceiving as the positives and negatives of what the LLMs and the tools themselves could do, um, and then use that as the basis to inform what that first investment decision was going to be. And I guess if I could pull one of many things out of what you've just said, I guess it's also not expecting that every single tool or use is going to be an end-to-end -end outcome, that it, it might always just be a first draft, that we have to put something on that. Others will be end-to-end -end outcomes, and it's really working that out, which it sounds like for you has been a process of study and somewhat of elimination as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, the tools, there's a wide variety of tools now. Yeah, obviously, the first gen of tools that we've seen were very much um, you know, chatbot, rag, corpus of information or documents you upload. We're seeing the market shift really quickly. There's a lot more workflow and more pur purported end-to-end -end solutions being offered. I'm seeing now um, applications where you can basically build your own application within the platform uh, that, that you can really super customize. So I think we're going to see different types of tools that um, can slot in and do different aspects and, and provide the power of LLMs in different ways, which I think is actually the really exciting bit is when we start to see different types of tools that you can start to really see how those end-to-end -end processes might be able to be come together, not just with a single tool. Yeah, absolutely. US, this is your world, right? You said in, in the intro that, you know, looking and determining use cases for, I'm assuming, a whole bunch of different legal service providers um, is one of the areas that, you know, Simplexico is focused on. Tell us what you're, what you're seeing, if you can. Give us a bit of a flavour of what's going on in your world. Sure. So from the conversations, so we've been speaking to everything from Magic Circle law firms to, to like smaller family offices through to education services through to legal technology companies. So we've kind of got an interesting position where we're seeing what's happening in all of the, the, the all, in all of the different organizations and all of the different kind of like structures they have internally. I think what we've ended up seeing is that the use cases tend to fall into three main buckets. And then with I, we like to talk about it more from perspective of AI from a broader, broader perspective rather than Gen AI yeah. in particular. So the first big, big bucket is around um, business of law or traditional business um, areas, functions. So HR, marketing, finance, all of that stuff is going to be um, affected by AI. And typically, there are already a whole swathe of tools available for um, AI-enabled finance or AI-enabled HR, which are becoming available on the market. Um, then the second really interesting area is which, what um, Tanya touched on earlier is that in organizations where they have um, existing um, data collection practices or data capture practices, they're really able to unlock value from that data through predictive analytics or data-driven predictions. And, and AI is playing, playing a big, big part of that. For example, in law firms, from an operational standpoint, there are a whole bunch of use cases which aren't as sexy as some of the other use cases around how can AI be used in operational efficiencies within a law firm, things like billing, matter management, there's like um, an age-old use case which keeps coming up with conversations around um, uh, billing descriptions or, or time card entries and how AI can help kind of lawyers um, slot better descriptions or pick better kind of time cards for what they're doing in their matters. And then I think the, the third really exciting area which Gen AI has enabled, which previously wasn't available in terms of the application of the technology, is around uh, the application of AI within legal practice. So within the legal practice or, or the day-to-day -day practice of a workflow and, and the del delivery of legal services, how can AI be, be applied or integrated or, or embedded within that workflow to deliver um, more higher quality outcomes, better efficiency, um, time-saving, um, reduction in risk and improvement in quality, et cetera. But I think the, the most important thing we've realized is that 
I think one of the one of the limitations um, Tanya mentioned is around the 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 misaligned expectations of what the market is saying and and the hype and the reality of the technology. So I think what we found very useful is to to do a lot of education upfront with with customers, uh, and we try and do, be quite transparent and adv we advocate for this in terms of what we do publicly. Um, just trying to de demystify the technology as much as possible and speak about it from a pragmatic standpoint so that when it comes to these conversations around actually interacting with the technology, there's more of a, a level-headed approach. Um, but when we have these conversations around use cases, it's much more problem-oriented or problem-focused as well as opposed to solution-focused. So we've built um, a framework that we published, I think, quite a while back last year around um, what we call actions and functions. So we want people to think about um, AI in a way where AI, as a as a broad kind of definition, definition definitional standpoint, AI is a is a technique or it's a technology where we want to try and mimic capabilities that humans have when it comes to problem solving and decision making. So what we did early on is we, from the conversations we were having, we tried to very precisely pin down what are the types of things lawyers do on a on a day to day basis where AI could now be used in a in a capacity. So we, we we I think we came across six or seven what we call legal AI actions where this where AI could be used and it, it ranges from extracting extracting information, labeling information, organizing information, finding information, drafting information, summarizing information, and then more recently interrogating information, transcribing information, translating information, and then there's a couple of a couple more which are which are popping up as we're having these conversations. So I think the the really key thing is taking the conversation away from these like broad, vague buzzwords around AR, Gen AI, large language models, RAG, to actually what are the particular th things lawyers are doing where you want to actually introduce AI. So that's the actions which speak about what you want the AI system to be able to do. And I think the really important part of the conversation which is emerging now is around the, the functions or the type of interaction that should be expected with the AI system. And we are, we've identified four of these. Um, so the, the first one, which usually gets conflated with AI, is around automation. So in an automation uh, standpoint or an automation function, there's no interaction with the human. It's completely machine oriented. Um, and then the, the, the second is around assistance. So a lot of the a lot of the the chatbot type solutions are assistive solutions. They help you draft an email. They help you kind of reword something. They they kind of very um, very simple tasks. And then the other two key areas are around assurance and acceleration. So assurance is more thinking about how an AI system can be used as like a, a goalkeeper to try and make sure you haven't missed anything. And I think the really exciting opportunity with Gen AI and the way lawyers work is around acceleration, where mm -hmm. the, the, the legal professionals or the humans are still in the driver's seat, but, but AI provides an opportunity for them to get to outcomes much, much faster or get to higher quality outcomes with, with, assist, with, with that acceleration within their workflows. So we've developed um, this framework and we're, we're rehashing it and should be coming out with a, with a more detailed framework of, of how we can start thinking and structuring use cases. Uh, we've, we've had interesting conversations where we've spoken to law firms where they've identified over 200 to 300 use cases internally. And then the, the real challenge becomes, how do, you, how do you enable the delivery of the technology into um, these large organizations where they have all of these use cases which vary from practice group from, to practice group, from team to team in very kind of particular ways. So what we've seen is that there are microwave type use cases, which um, assistive tools are quite good at. Think microwave, think, I don't know, in the UK, jacket, cooking a jacket potato is, is something you do in a microwave. You don't do that really in, in an oven anymore. So you put that in the microwave and you get out a jacket potato. So I think there's these kind of jacket potato type use cases where these large, um, these large uh, horizontal consumer or enterprise tools are very good at. And then there's more uh, Michelin star type of use cases. So a lot of legal work is high precision, high fidelity, um, high high delivery on outcome. And those types of use cases are, are much harder to serve because more often than not, you can't really cook a souffle in a microwave. You have to have like a very defined precision process around it. So what we're seeing is that um, there are these kind of horizontal use cases and there are these more specialist use cases. And the, the specialist use cases are perhaps where it might make sense for a firm, for example, to, to decide to build something specific for that practice area as opposed to using a microwave. So I think having having those distinctions in mind around what level of precision outcome you're, you're requiring from, from an AI tool uh, is important. 
but that has to come from the world of the domain experts as, as opposed to the world of the technologists. The technologists would, would always shout and tell you how amazing and great the technology is, but then it's always up to the domain experts to have that critical eye and say, no, a microwave is not good enough in this, in this circumstance. We need something high precision, high fidelity. And in order to, in order to get that high precision, high fidelity, um, it's not always going to be a tool on the market, which it would, which will enable you to do that. So I think that's where it's really interesting for firms to think about either building bespoke um, AI applications or thinking about how they can tailor and customize applications for those particular workflows. To come back to Tanya's point as well, it also requires some level of education and understanding of the technology to be able to make those sort of decisions or frankly even be able to find people that you can speak to um, to be able to have those conversations with. Um, thank you for that. Um, Julio, DLA Piper, use cases, anything jumping out there or that you that you have all been working on in particular? Well, uh, some, some of our projects are confidential, so they cannot be... Don't tell uh, us. But, <laughs> uh, in general terms, I, I want to uh, be a bit outside of uh, the crowd in the sense that uh, sometimes... Uh, we support clients on their AI solutions without the need of using AI because um, AI is a sort of bad word, uh, but when uh, you offer AI to your clients as part of um, their uh, legal operations, you have uh, an onboarding process that is really complicated, time consuming, requires an assessment, um, from the cybersecurity department, the IT department, and the client wants to use that technology. So uh, the onboarding process takes longer and some tasks can be performed uh, uh, even with the simpler solutions uh, that are cheaper and um, they don't require any sort of um, uh, technology to be installed in the environment of the client, uh, they are simple tools that allow a, uh, a risk assessment, which is the most urgent need for clients, at least from our perspective. Clients are in the urgency of using uh, AI because the business has um, the feeling that uh, they are going to be uh, left behind if they don't use AI or because um, uh, they have the feeling that their employees are using AI. I mean, I I'm from Italy and we have uh, so many fashion brands based here and the obsession of some of our clients is that their designers, their marketing people, even their HR people are using AI without telling them. Uh, mm -hmm. It actually happened the other day to uh, a client where one of their employees had found a fantastic AI-generated um, uh, solution to be used in front of a presentation to the whole uh, company, uh, over a thousand people. And obviously it was uh, a free solution to taken out of the internet and uh, where basically the usage was breaching any of the head of terms was uh, no compliance assessment was performed, but this gives you the perception of uh, how employees within corporations think that AI uh, is um, an enabler, it's simplifying their activities, it's, a, it's enabling activities that would take much longer in terms of time, in terms of all resources. What we help them to do, sometimes with AI, sometimes with much simpler and cheaper solutions, is to have an easy to use um, um, uh, risk assessment tool that uh, allows them to, to take on board the AI solution uh, in a shorter time uh, as part of a pilot project. We have so many clients that are running pilot projects because uh, as the other guy said, well, they don't know the potentials of the technology. So I'm testing that technology on 200, 300 people. And then if it works, I'm gonna expand it to the whole company. So I cannot spend 50,000 euros over 100,000 euros for that assessment. I need a, a quick risk assessment that allows me to uh, identify potential risks and defend the company against potential uh, challenges. 
This is not only relating to the UAI Act that should be published on the official gazette uh, in a few days, but also on privacy compliance, on IP compliance, and uh, also ISO standards are always uh, ahead of the pack because they are self regulations. Uh, so what we allow them is to have uh, a technology that is easy to use and allows this uh, compliance assessment uh, really in uh, just a week or so at a convenient price. Uh, and uh, this solution is something that our clients love uh, because uh, it gives them, uh, allow fine tunes their solution and allows them to give a, a kind of a stamp of approval, uh, telling the IT to go ahead. Uh, mm. Indeed, there is a clash between the IT department and the legal department. Most of our clients, when uh, uh, they need to adopt AI because uh, the IT seems uh, to know everything, it's always like that when it comes to technologies, and they sometimes uh, overlook the compliance and legal uh, risks that we allow them to validate, uh, again, in a fast and um, uh, convenient uh, manner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is a great segue to the question that I wanted to ask um, you, Tara, and I may pose this just to a, a couple of you. You folks are all in large organisations or have specialist knowledge that probably allows you relatively easily to differentiate tools. But for the large majority of folks that are working in the legal industry, they don't fall into your category. And it can be kind of overwhelming to see the number of tools that are entering the market and try to work out or even have the time and resources to go through the processes in a way that we have uh, just spoken to. So how is there a framework, Tara, that folks can adopt or think through or find that can help them make good choices about tools. And, and I am thinking here just in actually being able to get to those baseline things like efficiencies and stuff like that that they can improve versus perhaps the advanced stage of AR maturity, which is, you know, integration and augmentation, just trying to get a good habit of making good decisions or differentiating between the tools. Thoughts and advice on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's probably a number of frameworks, and and what I what I often say um, when I'm talking to clients, for example, who are asking us about how we've been exploring AI tools and and what what that's like, um, is that actually at the at the at the end of the day, this is about onboarding a technology. Let's leave the AI out of it, and in fact, all of the same considerations when you're looking to onboard any technology-based tool come into play. And those will be the vast majority of what you need to think about. You need to look at that vendor. You need to do vendor due diligence. You need to think about, in particular, data and security, uh, especially here with GDPR, et cetera, and understand um, what is the architecture of the solution? Where is my data sitting? Where is it getting stored? Where is it getting processed? Am I happy with all of the answers to those questions? And once you get comfortable with that, uh, ultimately, you need, as I said, you need your users to validate that this tool does what we want it to do, and it does it sufficiently well, or ideally much better than the mm -hmm. manual way of doing something. And that, for me, is the, the key to help get, getting that leg up on adoption. If, if it's not doing something at least better than the manual way, then you're going to have a lot of challenges at driving the adoption. And being able to benchmark that, um, generally speaking, is not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but if you're talking to your people and trying to understand, okay, so this tool helps you do A, B, or C, how do you normally, you know, just ask them really basic questions. How do you normally do that? How, roughly how long does it take you? It'll be slightly anecdotal because notwithstanding we record our time in the legal industry, uh, we don't actually have scientific data around how long it takes anyone to do a particular task or work stream. So you get some you know, anecdotal evidence around that, how many times they actually do that particular task or work stream. And then you can measure it against the tool and you, you have a good baseline, I think, to put forward you know, your, you know, your viewpoint on which tools you think are gonna drive the, the best and greatest efficiency, which tools might have the most um, success in terms of adoption. And, and that's ultimately, I think, the starting point. 
Um, so I don't think you need any particular specialist capability in order to do that. I think when you do layer on AI and gen AI, you do, again, to Tanya's point, you do need to understand the technology, but you, you, uh, you don't have to be, be a, a data scientist to understand that. And again, it ultimately comes down to, especially if you're talking to vendors, asking them, you know, deep probing questions, getting diagrams written down, validating that you do understand where those data flows operate and how, you know, where are the perimeters around your organization versus anyone else's servers and data. Mm. And once you can get to grips with that, actually it becomes really easy um, to answer everyone else's questions. And you're going to get piled on by risking compliance and data and security and legal internally um, to really, really dig deep and make sure we're super clear on exactly where everything sits and where everything will operate. Um, but I think the good news is, and, and in fact, we, we've had this recent experience is, you know, we did all that work um, within a team that actually, you know, frankly, other than me, didn't have any particular technical bit background. You know, my team is um, focused on user experience research and product management. Um, we were able to get across that quite quickly, um, have those conversations with our internal teams um, to the extent we've created all of the supporting and enablement materials as, as we head into our first rollout. And in fact, we got the feedback from our client commitments team that all of those materials contain all the answers that they've needed as they in particular had conversations with our clients um, mm -hmm. about where we're going and, and the conversations around new client terms that are looking to address whether or not we're using AI tools or not. So I think at, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just about sapping out the right information. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily require a particular, or a particular technical skill set. Um, of course, if you're going to go into the building space, then then yes, you're gonna <laughs> you are going to actually need some more technical capabilities. But there's new tools and different different types of tools. So I think there's a, a growth in kind of you know what I'm I, I like to call and I, I've stolen this from one of the vendors that used it, but low code or pro code tools. So a lot of tools that actually you know you can code some Python on top of it and and help customize it. So you do need you know, some proper um, coding capability. It's not It's not simply the drag and drop of the no-code tools that a lot of us are really familiar with legal. Um, but, you know, you've got those. So if you've got a technologist team or a data analytics team, those teams will actually be quite skilled up in being able to adapt to, to that. Um, if you're building wholesale, you know, of course, you're going to either want to have an internal capability or partner with somebody. And I think, you know, certainly we've seen a mix of that within legal, but that's been the case, I think, generally with technology as well. Each firm will and each company will take its own approach based on how they're set up. Um, but the core of what you're looking to do, actually, you don't need particular new skill sets, I don't think. So hopefully that gives lots of people comfort that they can dive in and just, you know, ask, ask questions. If you don't understand something, ask the question, because at the end of the day, you will be asked over and over again, those questions yourselves. So you need to feel really com confident in answering them. Absolutely. Tanya, I'm going to come to you in one second and kind of address the question of capabilities very squarely. But before we leave this point, you I just wanted to jump to you on this um, question or issue of large language models and just get your thoughts on, you know, are you seeing or even do you recommend that people build by, or I understand the third word now is modify, that's the preferred word, um, as opposed to anything else, or, um, or you know, how, how, how should people be thinking about that uh, in terms of their own product use? I... I don't think people should be thinking about large language models. I think people should be thinking about workflows and what problems they have and what bottlenecks they have within those workflows and how they want to enable transformation through a technology like Gen AI. I think it's it's far too easy to get caught up speaking about like the latest and greatest large language model. There's a new model release. Next week, there'll be another one. I think it's, it's very hard to keep track of that. And what's happened now is um, the technology has progressed so much in the past 18 months that there's almost feature parity in like the leading large language models. So what you get from one is almost what you'd get from another. And for a lot of use cases, um, any large language model will particularly do well. And it's only very specific kind of complex reasoning use cases where you need a more uh, a more particular choice of a large language model. So I think the, the, the key thing is understanding, um, having a good understanding of the use cases and understanding what the problem is you're trying to solve and creating some sort of baseline or measurable metric around that in terms of 
if the bottleneck is around efficiency, then creating a way to measure a change or improvement in that in that efficiency, independent of the choice of the language model, independent of the choice of the technology as well. Just from a process standpoint, are there things we can do to change um, what what we have and improve things? So I think the the conversation around large, large language models is an is an interesting one, and it's far too easy to get into get sucked into saying, hey, we're using the shiniest large language model without really understanding what the measurable impact of that is within a workflow. I think yeah. the the, the whole kind of like build versus buy versus modify is becoming an increasingly interesting conversation. Uh, and I think it comes to that like microwave versus Michelin star preparation kind of like distinction in terms of precision and fidelity of uh, uncontrol of quality outcomes. So for a lot of the um, the microwave types type use cases, it might it makes sense to kind of like buy a tool or buy an enterprise enabled tool so you can get some sort of something that you can put in the hands of um, interested or excited um, employees that they could start testing the tool and the technology. When it comes to the more of those like Michelin star, high quality, high fidelity, where you want quality on, on outcomes, I think there it makes sense to think about um, building or even modifying or as, as, as Tara mentioned, um, some sort of platform where you can create customizations for, for workflows. I think the, the really exciting thing is around when we've been speaking with um, larger organizations, larger law firms, they they have the budget available to go out and buy these expensive microwaves so that they can install them and, and give them to everyone internally. But then for a lot of smaller law firms, they're more cautious about budget. Uh, and, in, and, and what that means is that they have to be very, very precise and particular about the right use cases they select to progress into either developing, de developing a prototype or an experiment experimentation and then through to production. So I think there's this journey emerging of use cases where validating or structuring the use case in a very measurable way then moving into prototyping that use case um, with with users getting feedback at least at a functional level and, and validating what the technology can do or can't do and then pr pr then moving that into production once that's been validated so this this journey is emerging and for, for smaller firms it becomes more of a, a challenge of creating the right business case around can we get buy-in internally and in order to do that we need to be very very specific about the, the, the particular workflow, the particular bottleneck where we're trying to fix and then creating an ROI, ROI around that so that you can deliver that internally and get approval. I think the the technology with large, large language models is going to improve. I think it's it's only been 18 months and we've already come this far. So I think the technology will always continue to improve. But I think the, the really important thing is within UX design, there's this framework called Jobs To Be Done. And in that framework, they speak about for, for users, the really important thing is getting clear on what other particular jobs they have to be done independent of the technology. So the technology will always change. There will always be a new solution. There'll always be a new model. But I think for practitioners and domain experts, people like in kind of the legal world, the domain world, as opposed to the technology world, I think the key thing for them to think about is what are the particular jobs to be done in their workflows and how can they get really smart at understanding or measuring or just having awareness of what jobs are actually being done within legal workflows and legal processes and, and creating structure around that. And then once they have that understanding, then it's easier to go to the market and, and look for a vendor who's able to deliver a solution into that or go to the market and realize, oh, there's nothing on the market which can do that. Maybe it makes sense that we build something internally. But then obviously yeah. building something internally, it's a more complex conversation where you need skills and resources and things like that. Speaking of skills and resources, Tanya, um, I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to come back or circle back to the question around capabilities. And again, I think this is an area where people are kind of finding all of this a little bit overwhelming, um, both in terms of who they need on their team or changing roles or uh, changing capabilities. And I'm thinking, you know, law students fall into that category of being nervous about what they don't know, but practitioners are in that category of being nervous about what they don't know as well. Within all of that mix, and it's a big mix and a lot of people, are there are there things that are shaking out in the work that you're doing with your clients that you're seeing as almost like not negotiable capabilities, no matter what stage you're at, you're going to have to get to the point of having these capabilities to continue to practice? It's a big question. That's such a, yeah, it, it's such a good question, though. Um, I think... The biggest skill set that we all need to acquire in order to, you know, propel the industry forward is collaboration mm. because we all need to know across the industry what we are capable of, what our role is in the industry, and to make sure that we're not actually leaving anything behind. 
And mm. I say that in the sense, so for instance, I sit on the um, Law and Tech Committee at the Law Society of England and Wales, and we advise the UK government on the impact of um, AI on the legal profession. And what we're finding there is we have to work with the institutions that educate our um, future lawyers. We have to work with the junior lawyers who have just graduated. We have to understand what the law firms need to provide to their clients in order to really provide that holistic view. So, for instance, with the law students piece, the um, we're working with two universities predominantly and, and a few others as well. So the executive dean from King's College, Dan Hunter, um, he now has a, uh, he mandates the use of generative AI within some of his classes, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, you have to use generative AI and large language models to write these essays. So mm -hmm. they're kind of educating the students before they come out into how best to utilize this technology, because when you're playing around with it in your personal capacity on ChatGPT or Claude or whatever it is, um, you don't always know how to elicit the right response from the technology itself. So I think one thing that's really important for universities to do is to teach prompt engineering. At this point in time, for the um, large language models out today, whether or not people agree that prompt engineering will be a skill set that we require in five years' time or even in two years' time, I think is kind of like a side point. At this point in time, the large language models that we have need expert prompting in order to really elicit the best response. So I think prompt engineering really needs to be one thing um, when we're dealing with kind of chatbot-like things, um, chatbot-like tools. I think we need people who understand the law as well as people who understand the technology and that's not necessarily the same person and now we have people for instance like Tara right um, has that incredible knowledge across both areas but it's really really hard to, uh, to obtain that knowledge and indeed it's really hard to keep up with it the laws are changing but the technology is changing at such a rapid pace so we should be okay with saying I'm a lawyer I understand technology but I also have a technology expert who can tell me what to use, when to use, the capabilities of it, how to stretch my imagination in order to really deliver the best result for my client. And then we also need the client view because in some instances the client might say, well, hang on, my problem is not that you need to review a thousand documents. My problem is I need to determine whether or not I'm going to acquire this company, right? Mm -hmm. So we also need to rephrase and really understand what our clients need. So the skill set of design thinking, the skill set of understanding what is the core issue rather than how do I complete the tasks I've been completing over the last 10 years or 100 years in a more efficient way? Can I expedite that process? And then kind of the engineer comes in or the tech person comes in and says, well, actually, that's technically possible now or it's not. So collaboration, I would say, is the biggest piece. Um, and also upskilling on what the market is currently doing and where it's going for their junior lawyers and even for their senior lawyers, right? So I, I don't think that senior lawyers and partners, and to be fair, um, there is a large group of them that do not have this, um, this mindset that they, they're kind of like, look, I'm going to retire in five years' time. This is just not going to affect me or I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. You absolutely will you know, be very relevant in the near to medium term future. But you also have to kind of get on top of what is going on and how the new technology will affect the way you provide legal services to your clients and solve their problems. Yeah, absolutely. The way that I sometimes express that is no person will be untouched. There will be not a person in your firm or organisation that will not have to learn something. Um, I, I want to come to all of you and do kind of a closing round. But before I do that, Julia, I wanted to come back to you because, uh, you know, a, a good deal of the work that you've been doing is really looking at the emerging regulatory framework, I guess, for for AI. And if you haven't picked up the um, social media posts that Julia does on LinkedIn, do, um, because they're really, really worth your time to have a look at. But the question that I wanted to ask you here is, I'm wondering if this is going to be like the AI kind of laws and regulation are going to be a little bit like um, what happened with the privacy laws and regulations in that 
um, Europe, if you like, is going to set the standard for the world? I know it's slightly provocative in terms of asking you that question, but I'm just, you're immersed in it. So I'm just really interested to know, how do you think that's going to go? Well, uh, we hope that uh, the so-called Brussels effect uh, is going to happen. It happened with the GDPR um, and uh, it's likely to happen with the AI. I mean, if we look at what um, happened uh, at the latest G7 uh, meetings, we can see that there is um, a general consensus that AI needs to be regulated uh, because otherwise it might be genders. It needs to be regulated in a balanced manner. And we have seen that uh, the European Union uh, completely changed its approach to regulating AI between the first draft of the AI Act and the one that, the one that has been finalized. Uh, the idea is to regulate only when it's really needed. And uh, I, I believe that uh, the AI Act is going to become a, a common set of legislation that is going to expand internationally. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the first conversations that I had with my US colleagues after my, the approval of the AI Act was uh, that they saw that as a, as a nightmare because it was limiting what uh, our clients uh, were would have done but then the um, uh, I think the feeling changed there is a general understanding that if we in put in place um, uh, clear rules uh, then the adoption of AI is gonna uh, increase because uh, there is a general feeling of trust that AI needs and in order to create trust I need the clear and transparent rules that are that doesn't mean that we need uh, to over-regulate and I think the EU legislator didn't over-regulate. Uh, sometimes companies are a bit scared of uh, the impact of uh, the AI Act on their operations but uh, then as we've seen during this conversation most of the cases uh, the AI solutions that um, are used by organizations are low risk AI solutions like chatbots to automate customer support. If I don't provide the customer, uh, if I don't do any sort of risk assessment of the customer, I just give support that is a low risk and I need just to comply with transparency obligations. I, I need to avoid the hallucinations and um, Tanya and Tara were uh, tackling that, but I would have done it uh, anyway, because I need to test uh, uh, a machine that is going to speak to my customers. So it's not that uh, the AI Act is putting in place excessive obligations. Obviously, it's putting in place uh, a minimum set of legislation, avoiding that people, some companies are adopting solutions uh, uh, through an imprudent uh, approach just for the urgency of using AI. Uh, that should be avoided. It should have been avoided before the adoption of the UAI Act. Now we have a set of legislation with sanctions, but we'll, we have time to get compliant because then uh, we have uh, different deadlines for the coming into force of the different provisions of the AI Act. So, uh, I mean, I do believe that the approach from the European Union was balanced and appropriate. Thank you. I'm going to wrap by asking you all the same question. And we've just got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to have to get you to kind of choose your favourite response to this question. Um, and that is, this session is focused on Europe and the UK. All of you work internationally. So with that in mind, and Tara, I'm going to ask you this question first, what's unique about the legal Gen AI market in Europe or the UK? 30 seconds or less. Tick, tick, tick. <laughs> um, I, I think just in general, um, the, the support of innovation and the openness of firms and companies, clients 
and, 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 and academia and, and industry, I think working together um, has been really strong here and probably has a different dynamic. And I think that dynamic of collaboration, I think as, as Tanya pointed out, is especially strong here. And I think hopefully that bodes well for us. It's, it's, it's something that seems to be almost accompanying the whole Gen AI um, fold or rollout, I guess, in around the world, actually, that there's a generosity of community around we're all in this together that seems to be coming forward, which is really nice to see. Tanya, collaboration, which you mentioned earlier, anything else that jumps out as being unique? I think clients want things done differently. I think the clients are under a lot of pressure um, and things are not moving particularly well, um, like I mentioned in some of the economies, which means that they're, they're really tight on, on budget. Um, and I think that they have the, um, the risk factor, they really do, to try things out and to basically um, get to a stage where they're operating in a different way and having their, their problem solved in a completely different way. So I think it's the attitude that mm -hmm. I'm finding is really refreshing. So kind of a high level of, yes, let's get into us, let's engage with this, let's experiment with it that you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah. You asked what are you seeing in your work that is unique, you think, to Europe or the UK? Mm, it's a tough question. <laughs> I know. Um... So the tough ones to last. <laughs> I think there's definitely the the experimentation piece and the attitude, but I think there's also so I've been doing a bunch of conferences in Europe. But I think um, the the really interesting thing I found is that there is actually a sense of of community, not just around legal gen AI, but more broadly around legal tech. And um, I think that that community has a responsibility to to collaborate, but also communicate and educate the rest of the industry around how we want to take people forward and how we want to take the, the, the entire industry forward into a future where, where AI is part of that collaboration. So I think I think that's what I've seen recently. And and I think I'm that's what gets me really excited that if if this small group of like excited um trailblazers can can get things right and, and lead the industry, then I think we have we have positive hope for the future. Yeah, gets me excited too, I must say. Julia, the last word is yours. No pressure. Um, you <laughs> moved to Europe and the UK. Well, uh, my I would leave uh, the message that uh, AI uh, cannot be ignored. This was the general feeling at the beginning. And there is uh, exponentially an acknowledgement that AI cannot be ignored. I, I think someone said uh, 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 that the, uh, the approach from um, some legal practitioners is to wait uh, that they retire because it's something uh, far to come. It's already here. So yeah. everyone has to change the approach of uh, the legal, to the legal practice uh, and it's exciting. So I'm gonna summarize that as buckle up, but be excited. Um, there's <laughs> the best perhaps is yet to come, um, but the best has been here today in this session. Thank you very much, Tara U.S. Uh, Julio and Tanya, really, really appreciated your input and your time. And thank you, everyone, also um, who attended. Again, folks, thank you very much indeed. An absolute pleasure.